It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, before I start, I just want to um, thank those uh, folks who have arrived from Newfoundland yesterday uh, and the other folks that are on their way from the Canadian Armed Forces uh, and the Red Cross, leaving the safety of their homes to come to Ontario uh, to help us with this uh, uh, third wave of COVID-19, the severity of which is absolutely avoidable. Uh, we know that our ICUs are still overwhelmed, Speaker. They're overflowing uh, with patients. Uh, and we know what the experts have recommended for over a year now. The Premier last week, this is uh, the questions to the Deputy Premier Speaker. Uh, the Premier last week promised uh, the best paid sick days program in North America. And of course, as we know, the Premier's latest scheme has been roundly panned by all of the experts. In fact, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the docs, Dr. Abdu Sharkawi, sums it up by saying, that the program uh, is the definition of passing the buck, and more will die needlessly. Speaker, when will this government stop the nonsense and put in place a paid sick day program in the province of Ontario to save the lives of working people? To apply, the parliamentary assistant, the member for Burlington. Thank you, thank you so much, Speaker. Let me be clear. We are disappointed that the federal government didn't improve the programs as they said they would. But make no mistake, it is because of Ontario that this leave provision has been improved to what it is today, and it will be because of Ontario that we fix the outstanding gaps. But first, and we were the first in Canada to introduce job protective leave. We were the first to proactively work with the federal government to extend benefits to 20 days, and we were the first to proactively work with the uh, federal government to ensure payments were brought from 12 to 14 to 3 to 5 days. And we will continue to do whatever is necessary to support the health and safety of all workers in Ontario. Speaker. And a supplementary question. Speaker, it is very clear that this Premier has done everything he possibly can to avoid bringing paid sick days to our province. He eliminated the two measly paid sick days we had in this province back in 2018. In fact, he calls paid sick days a waste of taxpayers' money. He accused critics of the federal program of misleading Ontario workers. He has ignored all of the evidence of the, the, the help that paid sick days would bring to Ontario workers in avoiding catching COVID-19. It has been a week since our Premier promised the people of Ontario the best paid sick days plan in North America. When will this government stop protecting the Premier and start protecting Ontario workers with paid sick days? To reply, parliamentary assistant. Thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, let me be clear again. We're very disappointed that the federal government didn't improve the programs as they said they would. But make no mistake, Order. it's because of Ontario that this leave provision has been approved to what it is today, and it will be because of Ontario that we fix the outstanding gaps. But again, we were the first in Canada to introduce job protected leave. We were the first to proactively work with the federal government to extend benefits from 10 to 20 days. And we were the first to proactively work to make sure it wasn't 12 to 14 days, it was three to five days that people were getting their direct deposit. We will continue to do whatever is necessary to support the health and safety of all workers in Ontario. Speaker. Thank you. And the final supplementary. Speaker, it's been a year, and this government hasn't done what was necessary to protect the safety and lives of Ontario workers. They haven't done anything that the experts have recommended. They did not close all truly non-essential businesses and support them financially to get through this, uh, this next wave that we're in. They did not uh, bring vaccinations uh, in any urgent way in the numbers necessary to our hotspot neighbourhoods, as the experts recommended. And of course, they did not bring paid sick days into play here in this province, and they need to do it. Twenty-five times this government has voted in this legislature against 
paid sick days. Speaker, today we're going to have another debate because we are never going to give up on the workers of this province. This afternoon, another debate on paid sick days in this province and other uh, recommendations that experts have brought forward. The government has a chance to turn it all around this afternoon, do what the experts recommend. Will they support that motion this afternoon, do the right thing and save lives? Again, to reply, parliamentary assistant. Thank you so much, Speaker. Again, let me be clear. We are very disappointed that the federal government didn't order. improve programs as they said they Opposition would. Opposition, come to order. But make no mistake, it's because of our Premier of Ontario that this leave provision has been approved to what it is today, and it will be because of Ontario that we fix the outstanding gaps. We were the first in Canada to introduce job protective leave, the first to proactively work with the federal government to extend days from 10 to 20 for benefits, the first to proactively work with the federal government to ensure payments were brought forward from 12 to 14 days to three to five. Again, Speaker, we will continue to do whatever it takes necessary to support the health and safety of all Ontario workers. We move to the next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Deputy Premier. Speaker, the uh, Auditor General's report today confirms what we all knew that seniors in long-term care were left vulnerable uh, by successive Liberal and Conservative governments who didn't invest in long-term care uh, in, in any way that was necessary to give people dignity and quality of life. There have been decades uh, of, of neglect in long-term care. The, the government knew that COVID-19 was coming, and they should have been moving heaven and earth to protect those seniors, but we all know that they didn't. Instead, what this government did was eliminate comprehensive inspections. Uh, what they did was pretend that there was going to be an iron ring around long-term care that never arrived. They had no plan to support the residents in long-term care, and year after year after year, this government and the previous government ignored all of the recommendations uh, to, uh, to deal with the problems in long-term care. In April of last year, I met with the uh, Minister of Health, the Premier, a couple of other members of uh, this government's cabinet, and they told me at that time, even though they knew the state of long-term care, that they had everything uh, under control, that everything uh, was prepared for. No problem. Question? They had everything under control with uh, COVID-19. I, I guess the question is to the, uh, to the Deputy Premier Speaker, are they now prepared to admit that they weren't prepared in long-term care for COVID-19? To reply, Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And you know, I appreciate the comments from the member opposite. Uh, and I will remind the, the House here that uh, the, the previous government, and, and sometimes supported by uh, the, the leader of the opposition, oversaw. Order oversaw the challenges order. and neglected this sector. Opposition come so to order. I would like to thank the Auditor General and her office for this special report on long-term care because it really does note that very uh, first uh, comment that I've made that the, uh, the members seem to find humorous. Uh, the report's key findings suggest that staffing and the lack of new development and redevelopment of existing, ex existing long-term care spaces contributed to the spread of COVID-19. And to date, it's our government that has taken extensive and ongoing Order. measures to protect the health and safety and well-being of residents, staff, caregivers Order. and families. It is our government that inherited this Response. broken system that was sieged by COVID-19. And we will continue to take government house leader will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The Minister for Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries will come to order. The supplementary question. Speaker, the government knew that the situation in long-term care was a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, in fact, the minister would have known that there were many, many, many infectious outbreaks happening in virtually all of the long-term care homes before COVID-19 hit Ontario. Two-thirds of the homes were breaking IPAC uh, infection prevention and control rules constantly. She should have known that. She did know that. And yet, this government cancelled 
comprehensive RQI inspections. This government really ignored all precautionary principles. In fact, during the, uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis, they stopped all in-person inspections during the worst uh, of, the, uh, of the crisis. Measures to contain COVID-19 were initially left up to home operators, is what the AG's report says. So, how can it be that after explicit warnings, after knowing the state of affairs in long-term care, we still had a government that let so many seniors die? Mr. Long-term care. Thank you, Speaker. And you know today's recommendations. Uh, coming, and, and those that will come from the Long-Term Care Commission as well, they inform the work that is already underway to repair a broken system, badly neglected for many years, and uh, it is our government that is modernizing and fixing the long-term care sector. The neglect that happened over many, many years left a system that w could not respond uh, immediately to the, the uh, COVID-19, and we use the expertise of public health, Ontario Health, multiple ministries to address this as we went. And we we started early uh, with guidance in January. In March, there were more measures, and all throughout, in fact, there were so many measures, sometimes it was hard for the homes to, to keep up because there was so much work being done. And the Auditor General says, long-standing systemic problems in the sector were quickly and starkly amplified at the onset Response? and during the first and second wave of the pandemic and were contributing factors to the outbreaks and spread of COVID-19 in the long-term care homes. When she says that, she's talking about what was left in the wake by the previous government. Yep. Thank you. And the final supplementary. Speaker, seniors suffered in unspeakable conditions throughout COVID-19. In fact, the second wave was even worse than the first. This government cannot justify how they neglected our seniors. Look at the C Canadian Armed Forces report to see exactly what was happening in long-term care. 4,000 people lost their lives to COVID-19. Thousands of family members have been traumatized by the experience. Other Thousands of other seniors were left to suffer alone, with no support, with no family. This should have never happened, Speaker, and the AG's report clearly indicates that this government knew the state of affairs in long-term care. They knew and they were war warned. The long-term care system contrary to what this minister just said, is still in crisis. It's massively understaffed, massive, massive underinvestment, and this government's dragging its feet Question. and saying maybe in 2025 we may have some kind of improvement in long-term care. Not good enough. Stop dragging your feet. When will long-term care be fixed by this government? Members will take their seats. I remind members to make their comments through the chair. To reply, Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. I, I will point out uh, when the AG says, more than 10 years later, little progress has been made and the issue remains now with Order. significantly greater risks and consequences for the safety of residents. That is the leader of the opposition. That is the for legacy Waterloo, come to left order. behind. Member for Northumberland. The come leader of the opposition sat in this chamber and had the opportunity for many years to address what she knew and she didn't. And neither did the government of the day. It is our government that has taken responsibility for this sector so badly neglected for many years under the people sitting right there. And I will take no lessons from you as I work to repair long-term care and support staff, residents and families while you neglected it. Please make your comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Essex. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Speaker, the government knew that there were problems in long-term care left by years of neglect by the previous Liberal government, but the Auditor General's report shows that, just like the Liberals, the PCs ignored all of them. The report states that, quote, actions taken over the years have been insufficient to ensure that we would be better prepared as a province for the next time. The Auditor General says that concerns raised by experts in reports after reports for over a decade have been left to fester. Speaker, my question is how much more needless suffering and death is it going to take for this government to prepare long-term care for the next pandemic? To reply. Thank you, Speaker. And it is our government that's doing the work. 
Uh, it is our government that has put in a monumental commitment to four hours of direct care per resident, uh, to hiring 27,000 new hires into long-term care over the next four years, $4.9 billion commitment, not to mention the 8,000, over 8,600 hires that we were able to put in with the pandemic pay, and the historic levels of investment, the $1.75 billion, uh, another, almost another billion uh, recently announced for another 80 projects, the languishing sector that was left for so many years with only a few hundred beds built under the, under the previous government between 2011 and 2018 left this sector uh, at risk. And it is our government that is working around the clock to repair it, not only from the neglect left behind, but also Response. for a, a global pandemic. It's our government that is putting in the work. As the Minister of Long-Term Care, I am proud of everyone who's working round the clock to protect this sector and do the work that's needed. Supplementary question. Back to uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the Auditor General says that there are no surprises in her report. That's because despite what the Premier's bluster, there was no iron ring. Last Janu January, they didn't prepare long-term care homes for the incoming pandemic. They didn't properly train staff to handle outbreaks. They didn't even have gloves and masks and training for their own inspectors until after the military arrived. With, with two-thirds of homes reportedly failing to keep infections down, a pandemic was always a question of when, not if, Speaker. Speaker, my question is, why does this Premier and this Minister treat seniors in long-term care as second-class citizens without the respect that they so greatly deserve? Mr. Long-term care to respond. Thank you, Speaker. That is preposterous. Uh, I spent my career looking after seniors and Order. looking after the most vulnerable, and that is, uh, that is an absolute insult to every physician that looks after physicians and every PSW that is doing the hard work. There is no doubt that this sector had cracks and it was left open to COVID-19. We worked with public health. We worked with the scientists in, in, in Ontario, the best expert advice, and we took it early. And we worked with the Ministry of Health, and we worked across, across the ministries to shore up this system. It couldn't be turned around on a dime. The years of neglect were so bad, the staffing crises so severe, the, the crowding in our homes so severe. After so many years of neglect by the previous government, supported by the opposition, we could not turn it around fast enough. Response? But boy, did we try. And boy, did all those thousands of frontline the opposition workers come to continue order. to do the work and s uh, that the The next question, order. The next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Finance. I know for months our government has been calling on the Trudeau government to implement changes to the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit Program in order to ensure Canadians in my riding and across the province can self-isolate, care for an ailing loved one, or get vaccinated without losing their income. Despite repeated appeals from premiers across Canada and in the face of advice from medical experts, the federal government has failed to fill the gaps in their program and make sure workers can access funds quickly and easily. Given the federal government in their budget last week once again failed to deliver these needed changes for Ontarians, can the Minister of Finance tell the House how we intend to fill these gaps? The member for Willowdale and parliamentary assistant. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Oakville. This is a, a critical issue. Uh, as Ontario battles a devastating third wave of this global pandemic, driven by uh, dangerous variants that have crossed our border, Speaker, we must do everything we can to stop the spread. No one should have to choose between buying groceries and protecting the health of their family. That's why Ontario was the first province in Canada to ensure no worker could lose their job because they were self-isolating. That's why Premier Ford worked with the federal government to provide $1.1 billion in a paid sick leave program. And that's why, Speaker, after a very disappointing federal budget, which failed to deliver desperately needed changes to the federal program, our government stepped up to the plate and offered to fill the gaps by immediately doubling payments for all Ontario workers up to $1,000 per week, $25 per hour for four weeks. 
Speaker, Spons? this government will continue to fight for Ontarians, and we need our federal partners and all members of this legislature to put politics aside and ensure every worker in Ontario has access to adequate paid sick days. Order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the parliamentary assistant for the answer and uh, commend the minister for stepping up to supplement the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit. I know there's a lot of information out there, misinformation on this program, Speaker, and that the opposition for a year now has been trying to convince Ontarians that the program doesn't exist and that Ontarians do not have access to paid sick days through the, provincial, the federal program. I'm glad that our government is trying to work collaboratively with Ottawa to improve access to make sure there is no gap in pay and that workers don't have to worry about losing their paycheck. But can the minister please explain why improving the federal program is the best way to deliver paid sick days to Ontarians that we badly need in this pandemic? Parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. Working with the federal government is the simplest and fastest way to get money into pockets. We need them to continue partnering with us to get this job done. Unfortunately, yesterday the Prime Minister and the Federal Minister of Finance suggested that instead of delivering more money directly to workers, the province should force already struggling small businesses to pick up the tab. Speaker, our government has spared no expense in protecting the health and safety of Ontarians and supporting the struggling small businesses, the job creators, that have sacrificed their livelihoods to keep our communities safe. Our government does not believe that businesses should bear the increased burden of a paid sick day program, as members opposite have suggested. And instead, our government will remain steadfast in our commitment to protect workers by providing this support directly. The federal government already has the means to deliver the program, and we are willing to pay the bill, Speaker. I hope that they will work. Response. Thank you. The next question, the member for Timiskaming Cochrane. My question is to the Premier. The Premier is fast-tracking a new 400-series highway that will carve through irreplaceable farmland and the Green Belt. Highway 413 will cost at least $6 billion, but it will save drivers about 30 to 60 seconds per trip. And now research from environmental defense shows that the highway could lead to 17.4 million extra tons of greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles by 2050. So it's not going to help drivers. It's certainly not going to help the environment. It will make money for powerful developers. It will. That's... that's <laughs> goes without saying. At what point is the Premier going to put the public interest ahead of the interest of his donors and cancel this wasteful and harmful highway project? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, there is a strong case for moving forward with the Highway 413. By 2051, the population of the Greater Golden Horseshoe is expected to grow to almost 15 million people. Leader of the opposition, come we to order. We need our road infrastructure to keep up. We must alleviate congestion, which is already terrible in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, before it gets worse for commuters and before Leader it gets Leader of the opposition worse will come to order. Mr. Speaker, we want to get this right. That is why we're continuing the environmental assessment process, which the Liberals cancelled. We believe that work on this project, on the environmental as assessment aspect, is essential so that we can determine whether or not we move forward with Highway 413, which is a criti Response. could be critical infrastructure for the people of York, Halton, and Peel regions. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The minister just said there's a strong case to be made for the highway. We would contend there's also a very strong case to be made for the environment. Yes. <laughs> and, as a, and as a farmer, an even stronger case to be made for agricultural land. We lose 175 acres a day now. The 15 million people that are going to be living in the GTA in a few years are going to need food. food. And we're going to need farmland, and you can't build it. And now we have the chance to plan ahead to protect it. So again, we need to look at these projects from the environmental point of view and from agriculture, from feeding the people point of view. Is that going to be a major component in determining how you go ahead with the development of this province? Reply. Once again, the Minister of Transportation. I thank the member opposite for his, for his comments, and I, and I agree. 
And that is why our government resumed the environmental assessment process so that we could consider whether or not to proceed with the Highway 413 with all of the facts and evidence that are necessary to make decisions of this magnitude. The Liberals didn't think that that was important. They think we should just let people come to the Greater Golden Horseshoe and not consider what kind of infrastructure is necessary. But I agree we need to consider all environmental impacts, which we will get. We will get the information from the environmental assessment process when we need to consider impacts on agriculture, on farmland, on the green belt, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, we're not the only ones who think that it's important to consider this infrastructure. So does the Ontario Livestock Transporters Alliance, and so does the Peel Federation of Agriculture. So is the member opposite suggesting that I ignore their request for me to consider whether we should move forward with this infrastructure? Order. Because they are speaking for their communities. They are speaking for the Response. needs of their industry. I believe it's important to take, account and take into account the needs of all our stakeholders as we study whether or not to proceed with this highway, Mr. Speaker. Sure. There's way too much heckling in the House this morning. Please come to order and allow the member who has the floor to make their presentation so that I can hear that person. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Today, the Auditor General released a report about the government's response to COVID-19 in Ontario's long-term care homes. In the report, it details ALC patients were transferred to, from hospitals to crowded homes during the first wave. Homes struggled to provide adequate space and staffing to address the surge. Simply put, they were not prepared for the influx of patients. This morning, the Minister of Health announced that the government is now instituting an emergency order to transfer ALC patients from hospitals to long-term care homes that are not their choice. There was some confusion this morning. The minister said that we be transferred with their consent in her remarks, and the press release clearly says without their consent. So can the Minister of Long-Term Care confirm Question. that patients are being transferred without their consent? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I'm very pleased to confirm the statement that was made today and the uh, decision that has been made. There is a situation where, uh, because of the uh, crowding in our hospitals right now, where there are some patients who are there who are alternate level of care or no longer needing hospital services that are waiting for their first choice of a transfer to a long-term care home. What we are saying today is in the situation of extreme overcrowding in a particular hospital where there is a surge, there will be a discussion with some of those patients, those people, to determine whether they are willing to move to a long-term care home that is not their first choice. That would be discussed in advance. It would be a very respectful discussion. It would take into consideration all of the issues that are important to people, including ethnocultural considerations. There would be no charge for the uh, co-payment, and that we would ask for their consent, but there may be circumstances under extreme uh, overcrowding in our hospitals where it might be necessary to transfer someone without. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. The bottom line is, you're going to transfer, you have the power to transfer people without their consent. So you may recall, I raised this issue with the Minister of Long-Term Care in November about capacity in long-term care homes. It's five months later, and now what the government is having to do is take an extreme measure, an extreme measure because Order. they failed to plan adequately for capacity in long-term care. So if the government's going to do this, there's a number of things that need to be in place. The, the homes Minister must of be Heritage, able to provide Sport, appropriate Tourism, care Culture, and have appropriate staffing. New residents must, must be fully vaccinated so they don't have to isolate. So should their essential caregivers. There should be some geographic limits to this. And there should be a structure in place, an incident management structure in place, something, something to prevent the things that happened in the first wave from happening this in the third wave. So, Speaker, can the minister confirm that these types of provisions along with others in consultation with the sector, will take place to ensure that we don't have our people Thank you. Minister of Health. Yes, absolutely, I can confirm that. All of the issues that have been mentioned by the member have been taken into consideration, and any uh, movement that might have to take place would only be under a situation where there is an extreme surge in a particular hospital. 
One, we hope that we never have to use it, but we have to be prepared in the event of another surge because of this third wave, because of the variants. It's important to plan ahead. That's what we're doing. We really don't want to have to use this. If we have to, of course, we would do that very respectfully and have that conversation with the family, with the person being transferred. They would still maintain their place on the list for their first choice. They would not have to pay the co-payment. They would be vaccinated before they would leave. And in addition to that, we are setting up a, a, a hotline for people to call Response. if their family member is decompensating in a new situation for alternate arrangements to be made for them to be moved to another place where they will um, do better. Because we are looking for a perfect match, but there is a Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the uh, Minister of Finance. Yesterday, Ontario's 2021 budget received royal assent. In that budget, which every member opposite voted against, our government invested $16.3 billion in Ontario's health care system to build capacity, help battle the third wave of the pandemic, and support our heroes on the front line. Ontarians know that our health care system is under serious strain and is being pushed past its breaking point after years of underfunding by the previous li Liberal government that left our hospitals vulnerable. Our government has invested historic amounts into Ontario's health care system. At the same time, the federal government's share of health care funding has been steadily shrinking. Can the Minister of Finance tell us why Ontario and every single province in Canada and territory has called on the federal government to honour their commitment to the long-term sustainability of health care in Ontario and Canada? Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Willowdale. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Member for Oakville. This is an important question. While collaboration and temporary funding has helped to address some challenges over the course of the pandemic, COVID-19 has also underscored long-standing challenges facing the health system that require urgent action on the part of the federal government. Enhancing the Canada health transfer remains one of our government's top priorities. Every premier in Canada, of every political stripe, has called on the Trudeau government to increase the Canada health transfer to cover 35 per cent of health spending, a far cry from the 50 per cent that was the original deal. With an aging population and a rapidly expanding demand for services, Ontario needs a stronger federal partner to ensure we can improve wait times, reduce surgery backlogs, and provide access to more beds and better treatments and come out of the pandemic with a stronger, more resilient world-class health care system. And the supplementary question, back to the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for the answer. I know that my constituents are worried about the health care system and want every level of government to make sure it's protected for future generations. For decades, past governments failed to fix hallway health care and build the capacity we so desperately need today. Health care spending is rising rapidly in Ontario, and we can see with the shrinking Canada health transfer that the cost is going to be increasing for Ontario taxpayers. Would the minister please tell us what the members of this House can do to ensure the federal government meets their commitment and does not abdicate their responsibility on Canada's public health care system? Parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the Ontario NDP and the Ontario Liberals couldn't find a single issue with what was in our government's last budget. And despite record spending, historic spending to protect the health care system, members opposite repeatedly called on this government to spend more. Yet the opposition is oddly silent, Mr. Speaker, as the Trudeau government allows the Canada Order. health transfer to shrink every single year. Over the coming years, the CHT will decrease from 22 to just 18 percent, a gap of $30 billion a year. So, Speaker, while this government is making unprecedented investments in health care, it's the federal government that will be cutting health care funding in Ontario by $30 billion annually. So I hope that all members of this House will stand up to protect public health care in Ontario, join this government and the leadership Response. shown by Premier Ford, put politics aside, call on the federal government, call on the Trudeau government to live up to their commitment and protect the long-term sustainability of Ontario's world-class health care. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On Monday, government members shot down Bill 275, a diverse procurement strategy supported by informed stakeholders who fully understand how women and BIPOC business owners have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. At one point during the debate, a government member said, 
we cannot rush diversity. Speaker, this comment coming from a government that gutted the anti-racism directorate and cancelled Indigenous curriculum writing is a bit rich. It seems that when it comes to actually doing work to support BIPOC folks and address the she session, the government is all talk and no action. In fact, we're still waiting for the much-talked-about Women's Economic Task Force. Bill 275 can make a real difference in to Ontario's diverse businesses, and you need all the help you can get. Why would the government choose not to support Ontario's diverse small business owners in the middle of a pandemic? Remind the members to make the comments to the chair to reply on behalf of the government. The government has to uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the question from uh, from the member opposite. Uh, we, we, we've seen look, we've seen a number of bills that have been brought forward by the opposition that uh, uh, that really don't address uh, the issues that. Uh, uh, as they suggest that they would, Mr. Speaker. We have put in a number of, uh, when it comes to procurement, of course, uh, we were left with a situation by the previous government uh, where there was no such thing as a centralized procurement, Mr. Speaker. It really put us in jeopardy when we started to respond uh, initially to the pandemic. So we moved quickly to ensure that that, uh, that was addressed and going forward uh, as well, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to supports for uh, our small, medium uh, job creators, look, we saw just the other day an attack on them in this place, Mr. Speaker, when uh, the members of the Liberal Party brought forward a bill that will put severe punishments on our small and medium job creators, Mr. Speaker. We turned that down because they cannot afford to pay any more, Mr. Speaker. That was supported by the opposition, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to supporting our small and medium job creators, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to have their backs, Mr. Speaker. That is what progresses. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, Speaker, we're in the middle of an entirely avoidable third wave. Small businesses continue to struggle to even access funds that were promised to them after the Boxing Day lockdown during the second wave. They're still waiting for leadership from this government. There's a laundry list of complaints from small business owners about the Small Business Support Grant. My colleagues and I have also reached out countless times asking for support for our business constituents who employ 80 per cent of the workers in Ontario. It's gotten to the point where the problems with this grant program are jeopardizing livelihoods and will undermine economic recovery. Speaker, to the government, what went wrong with the grant program and why is it taking so long to fix it and to support small businesses across this province? To apply, the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question uh, from the member opposite. We understand that businesses have been faced with uh, incredible pressures throughout this pandemic, but the Small Business Support Grant has, as of uh, today, paid out. Uh, $2.4 billion in payments to small businesses, uh, 107,000 first payments uh, and an Order. automatic doubling of which was committed to in the previous budget of that. Uh, 57,000 businesses have also received their automatic second uh, uh, payment uh, in that support grant uh, for over 873 For Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Portion. In terms of uh, some of the delays some businesses are experiencing, we have uh, tripled the support staff on the back end to ensure that we get back uh, to those businesses in as, uh, as quickly as possible and ensure that they can get the supports and money into their bank accounts, because we do recognize this is a challenging time. But over 107,000 first payments and 57,000 uh, second payments for over $2.5 billion in direct support. Okay. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. COVID has taught us that failing to follow the scientists has catastrophic consequences, paid sick days being one example. Scientists are warning us of the urgency to act on another pending crisis, the climate crisis. A new report today shows that Highway 413 will increase GHG emissions by 700,000 tons per year. 17.4 million tons of climate pollution in the next three decades. So, Speaker, will the Premier listen to the scientists and not the land speculators and cancel Highway 413? To reply on behalf of the government, Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, as I indicated 
earlier to the member opposite. I thank the member for the question. As I indicated earlier, uh, we are doing the important work of completing a complete, a fulsome environmental assessment process as we consider whether or not to proceed with Highway 413. We believe, unlike the Liberals, that it's important to collect all the evidence. The information that was published today is, of course, of great interest and will feed into the work that we're doing. But we believe that the demographic growth in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, Horseshoe to come in the next few decades warrants our government taking the time to consider what the transportation needs are of the Greater Golden Horseshoe, and that means continuing with the environmental assessment process for Highway 413. Supplementary question. Speaker, an expert panel has already concluded that the costs of Highway 413 far exceed any benefits. The report today shows that the costs of air pollution alone will be $1.4 billion. The highway will pave over 2,000 acres of prime farmland and unleash sprawl on additional farmland needed to grow food. It will pave over 400 acres of the Greenbelt, increase climate pollution to a point where we will not be able to, to meet our obligations, cost taxpayers six to ten billion dollars, all to save commuters 30 seconds. I think the evidence is clear. The scientists, the experts, now local municipal councils, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture and others are saying, Question. listen to the science, cancel Highway 413, and use that money for higher priorities. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the GTA West Highway Corridor is subject to an individual environmental assessment, which is among the most stringent assessment processes on record. As I've indicated, we're taking the time, the necessary time, to study the highway and all of its impacts. That includes taking in information from stakeholders who are looking for additional transportation infrastructure so that they can get their goods to market. As Minister of Transportation, it is my responsibility to oversee the transportation network today and to consider what its needs are for tomorrow. And so we are doing that important work, Mr. Speaker. We believe it's essential for drivers in, in, the, in, the, coming, in the coming years, but also in the coming decades, and we will do all the work that's necessary as we study the project itself. Thank you. The next question, again, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Finance. Uh, in the past week alone, there have been dozens of flights into Toronto's Pearson Airport carrying passengers with dangerous COVID-19 variants. There have been other possible exposures at airports in Hamilton and Ottawa. While Ontarians are largely doing their part to stop the spread of the virus in the communities, variants coming across our borders are making the pandemic harder to contain. I know our government has taken action by issuing an emergency order restricting travel between the Manitoba and Quebec land and water borders. But as case numbers explode in countries around the world, international flights continue to land in Ontario every single day. Mr. Speaker, will the government renew its call to secure our airports as the federal government should have done months ago? To reply, the member for Willowdale and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for, from Oakville for that question. Speaker, everyone knew that these variants of concern were a threat, but the federal government did too little, uh, way too late, to protect us from them. The difficult but necessary measures Ontarians followed to curb the first and second wave are struggling to flatten the variants during the third wave of this pandemic. Canada could have avoided these devastating variants with stricter border measures like those in Australia uh, and, and kept variants out, or with a consistent supply of, of vaccines to better protect people like we've seen in Israel or, or in the UK. Speaker, the Trudeau government has finally halted flights from India after weeks of warning, uh, but all travelers, regardless of where they are coming from, may have been exposed to a variant. The federal government is responsible for our airports, and we need the federal government to secure our airports now. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the parliamentary assistant for the answer and thank the premier for his leadership in calling for the federal government to secure our borders. My constituents are concerned that despite the steps our government has taken to prevent land crossings at the borders of Manitoba and Quebec, there are no measures in place to protect our province from the expansion of COVID variants through air travel internationally or domestically. The federal government's quarantine hotels were supposed to prevent cases from entering the country, but as we reported last week by the CBC, thousands of travellers are simply walking across the border in order to avoid this failed measure. 
Over 70 per cent of the daily cases in Ontario today are confirmed as variants of concern. As we know, these variants did not originate in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, what can the Ontario government do to prevent measures, cases and future variants from entering this province? Parliamentary Assistant. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and the member is absolutely right. Our, our government has been doing our part, but the provinces cannot beat this third wave alone. We need our federal partners to step up. We need more vaccines and tighter border restrictions to prevent more variants of concern. Minister Jones and Minister Elliott wrote to, to Ministers uh, Haidu and Blair asking for mandatory pre-departure testing for anyone on a domestic flight into Ontario. Uh, we welcome the actions the federal government has taken uh, of late, but they have not gone far enough to prevent the COVID-19 variants of concern from entering Canada. Speaker, to ensure that we're able to beat this third wave and finally get past COVID-19, we need the Trudeau government to get serious about closing the border, make testing mandatory for interprovincial travellers at airports, and get more vaccines into arms, more arms in Ontario and across Canada. Thank you. Okay, the next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Speaker to the Premier, I rise today for Gloria, who lives on Vaughan Road in my community. She has given over 30 years of her life to advocacy, fighting tirelessly for affordable housing and childcare. Gloria, a senior, has shown up for many in our community and in Ontario. She needs this government to show up for her today. Gloria's hip replacement surgery and her CT scans have been postponed several times during COVID. Her osteoarthritis is getting worse. She's tormented physically and mentally daily by a pain that has literally stolen her mobility. Speaker, to the Premier, knowing fully well that over $700 million is necessary to tackle the still-growing surgical backlog, your Conservative government in your budget just passed only allocated $300 million, not even half of what's necessary. To the Speaker, when will Gloria be able to get her surgery? What would you, Conservative government, like me to tell Gloria today on behalf of your government when I leave question period? Because I'm giving her a call right after. Please answer, Premier. Thank you. Again, I ask members to make their comments to the Chair to reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, the, the member has raised a very important point. We have invested actually over $500 million in order to proceed with the backlogs of surgeries and diagnostic procedures that we have had to postpone because of the increase in this third wave and the increase in our hospitals. This has created more space for more COVID patients, but I understand that there are many people who are waiting for their surgeries. Notwithstanding that, we have been able to provide over 430,000 scheduled surgeries since the start of this pandemic. And as soon as the numbers subside and we are able to admit more patients into hospital, it is an absolute priority for us to proceed with those surgeries and uh, procedures because we know that although they're called Order. elective, they're not really elective. People need them to be done. So Spons? that is a, a priority for us and something that for we For Toronto St. Paul's come to order. As soon as we see the COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Toronto St. Paul's to ask your supplementary question. Back to the Premier. Now let's talk about the Ontario Small Business Support Grant. This government said last month they doubled this grant program to help our small businesses in my community and that eligible recipients were automatically entitled to a second payment. Speaker, there are countless small businesses in St. Paul's. They've applied, they've been denied, they ask for questions, for a rationale, they get no response from the government. Others flat out are denied because their business is apparently too new to qualify. Some are eligible but are still denied. Joanne, who owns Vegwood, a black-owned business, by the way, serving vegan food, a crowd favorite in our Oakland Village community, was told by this government that money was on the way, 10 business days, Question. but she's still waiting. Where is Joanne's funding? When is the government going to fix the Ontario Small Business Grant Program that is direly fraught with errors? So the Associate Minister of Small Business, Red Tape Reduction. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite uh, for the question. 
Uh, we recognize that this is a significantly difficult time. There's no sugarcoating it. Businesses have been impacted. Uh, we are uh, processing second payments in terms of the first payments, over 107,000 uh, direct payments to businesses, uh, over $1.5 billion paid out through that. Second payments of over $873 million have been processed. Uh, we have uh, tripled the support staff on the back end to ensure businesses, uh, uh, like the ones mentioned, uh, are getting the support, uh, are being able to uh, be attended to and ensure that we do get that uh, payment to them as uh, soon as possible. On top of that, we do have other support programs like Digital Main Street, a $2,500 grant uh, for businesses to help Member for uh, Toronto, St. Paul's, come to order. access uh, up to 90 per cent in federal supports for the rent program, 75 per cent in wage subsidies, and also 100 per cent of their property tax and energy costs. Minister of Heritage, come to order. When the Speaker asks you to come to order, that means you stop heckling. The next question. The member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. It's been a month now since the first time I voiced the urgent concerns of my writing in this House regarding vaccine accessibility. Since then, the numbers have only gotten worse. Ottawa Public Health has identified Vanier, Overbrook, and Lower Town as high risk neighbourhoods. Yet, not a single one is considered to be a hotspot, and each of those neighbourhoods has only one pharmacy to serve their high-density population. So why is the minister not trusting Ottawa Public Health numbers to designate hotspots in Ottawa to better target high-risk area, and when will actions be taken to protect Ottawa hotspots that have been forgotten? To reply, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, primarily, the issue has been a supply of vaccines up until now. However, we are expecting large quantities of the Pfizer vaccines to come in starting next week and throughout the entire month of May. We're also receiving Moderna vaccines today as well. So we will be able to expand both within hotspots and to regions across the province of Ontario. As the member knows, there have already been 114 hotspots identified by postal code. They're based on situations relating to high uh, hospitalizations in the past, high ICU, unfortunately, uh, a large number of deaths as well. We are identifying new hotspots and we are dealing with them with these vaccines that are coming in. We're also expanding them in more pharmacies, including pharmacies that will be open 24-7 in order to be able to respond to people who, through work or otherwise, uh, need to have that additional flexibility to be able to receive those vaccines. Thank you. The supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My follow-up uh, also to the Minister. The science table has revealed that five higher-risk postal codes they recommended were left off the government list of hotspots. Meanwhile, eight lower-risk areas were included. We're still wondering why. The government also didn't initially follow the table's guidance on how many hotspots should be identified and how the vaccine should be allocated. Clearly, the choices of hotspot communities were not informed by all the necessary data. Since we can't take vaccines away from already targeted areas, we understand that, but it's crucial that high-risk areas that have been left out be prioritized as well. And I understand the minister indicated that that was the intention. So can the minister commit to readjusting the list of hotspots to include the high-risk areas that have been excluded, and when will that be done? Minister Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. First, it's, it's really important to note that the identification of the original hotspots was made with clinical advice of medical experts. The uh, medical experts on this science advisory table obtained the information from Ontario Health that was provided to the Vaccine Task Force. The Vaccine Task Force and, and uh, the uh, other medical experts applied other criteria, including some of the barriers to uh, vaccines. The, situation which had dealt with what their situation was in wave two, vaccine hesitancy, uh, ethno-cultural factors, socio-demographic factors, to make sure that we had a full picture to identify those vaccine hotspots. Notwithstanding that, there are other hotspots that are being identified, and we do have vaccines available to send to those areas as well. This will be uh, more readily Response. available, of course, with the additional vaccines that are coming in starting next week, but we will make sure that we identify the original hotspots and deal with those, as well as new hotspots coming forward. 
The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Earlier this week, both Toronto and Peel moved to shut down workplaces because of COVID-19 outbreaks. They're shutting them themselves because the province is refusing to act to save workers' lives. The government's own advisory committee, chief medical officer of health, unions and business groups are saying workers need provincial paid sick days to be safe in the workplace. Yet every day, workers in hot spots are forced to choose between going to work sick and feeding their families. The choice is killing people, and this government's to blame. Today is a day of mourning. In the labour movement, we mourn for the dead and pledge to fight for the living. New Democrats are fighting. Workers are fighting. Health care providers are fighting. Why won't this government join the fight? Listen to the expert. It's provide paid, provincial paid sick days. Why are they letting workers get sick and die? Mr. Speaker, I, I don't even know how to answer that question for the member opposite. The suggestion that any member of this House, on either side of this House, uh, is, is, is wanting workers uh, not to be safe is absolutely, incredibly preposterous. And the member opposite Order. knows it. He does a disservice Order. to every single member who has worked in this chamber for decades to improve the rights of workers in this province, Mr. Speaker, when he uses language like that. I can tell the member opposite that I care every, but, every bit as much about workers in my riding as he does in his riding. And I certainly, I certainly would never the opposition I would never order. rise in this chamber and suggest that any of the members opposite uh, care any less about the people that they represent than, uh, than, than I do, Mr. Speaker. So Spons. if the member wants to ask a question, a proper question, without such insinuations, Mr. Speaker, without such language, then he'll get a proper answer. Order. 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 Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. And I'll respond to that, sir. People in this province are dying every day, and they're dying because they can't get paid sick days. They're dying because they can't go to work and put food on their plate for their families. There's a reason why paid sick days are important in the province of Ontario. And I believe that everybody in this House should support paid sick days, do everything we can to make sure that worker that is going an essential worker is going to work every day to provide a food on that plate for their family, put rent, pay their mortgage. And we can fix that. Right here in this house, we can fix that. And you know how we fix it? On the day of mourning, we provide provincial paid sick days so those workers can take the day off. So they can make sure that their family's taken care of. We just had a 13-year-old girl die because the worker was essential, worker was going to work and brought COVID home. What are we doing? So when you can tell me that you're upset with me, for saying that what I did. That's how I feel. I don't want anybody dying because they're a worker in the province of Ontario because this government won't provide paid sick days. That's what it's about, sir. It's about saving lives, making sure that worker can go to work and perform a fair day's work for a fair day's pay safely. Thank you. Thank you. General, my members to make their comments to the chair. Thank you, Tom. Governor House City. And the member opposite is exactly right. That is exactly what it's about. That's exactly what we are doing here, Mr. Speaker. Protecting workers is exactly what Order. all of us should be doing. I would never for a second uh, suggest that the member opposite's passion on this topic uh, is, is anything but, uh, but legitimate. And I appreciate the passion that he brings to this debate, not only today, but each and every day. I appreciate the work that he has done over his lifetime to advance uh, the rights of workers. I know that he has worked in a union for many, many years, Mr. Speaker. And I understand through many, many years of living in a household with a, with a parent that went to work, with family members who went to work. We just talked about earlier, the member for Eglinton Lawrence, about those Italian workers who came in the 50s and 60s and worked so hard to build this community, Mr. Speaker. I understand how important Order. it is to protect workers. And this government understands that, Response. and that's why we are going to do everything in our power to continue to make the lives of workers, essential workers across this province, safer, Mr. Speaker. We will have their back, and I hope that we Thank you. Yeah. Their back. Thank you. The official opposition will come to order. The next question, the member for Scarborough-Gildwood. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. With the variance of concerns ripping through Scarborough, Brampton, and the hottest of hotspots, we are not doing enough to protect our communities and to protect essential workplaces. And, uh, you know, the clinics in Scarborough are still closed, the hospital clinics. So you have promised a 50 per cent uh, increase to hotspots, and we are going to look for that. Workers at Fiat Chrysler Automotive reached out to me to ask what we are doing to protect people working in Ontario plants. When will they be prioritized? Many of these workers live in non-hotspot postal codes and therefore ineligible for a vaccine in their home community. But every day, they go to the hottest of hotspots. So my question okay. to the Deputy Premier is, when will these workers who work in the hottest hotspots, putting their lives and their families at risk, receive a vaccine? And to reply, Minister Clark. Thank you very much. Well, I can certainly agree with the uh, member opposite that there are many hot spots in Scarborough right now. I believe there are 15 postal codes that have been identified as having hot spots. Uh, they will be receiving presently. 25% of the vaccines from the top are going to the hot spots in Peel and Toronto, and we are. Uh, looking at 50% because we know that if we address the transmission in the hotspots, including in, in Peel, in Brampton, as well as in Scarborough, that will be for the benefit of everyone on Ontario because 80% of the transmission is happening in 20% of the locations. So we are prioritizing that. We know that we need to uh, deal with uh, getting more vaccines into those areas. And now with the increase in vaccines coming, uh, starting next week, we will be able to do that without in any way taking Response. away any vaccines that are going to any other place. So with those additional vaccines, we will be prioritizing those hotspots in Peel as well as in Scarborough and other parts of Toronto as well. Okay. Thank you. The time for question period this morning has expired. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.